وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله الذي شرح صدور أوليائه بالإيمان وفتح لهم أبواب النصوص بقواعد البيان وصلى الله وسلم على من أنزل الله عليه الكتاب والميزان وعلى آله وصحابته ومن تبعهم بإحسان أما بعد Now we're going to go into the third chapter العلم After the author رحمه الله الشيخ محمد بن صالح العثيمين He spoke about the definition of fiqh And if you remember correctly What was the definition that he gave for fiqh? The definition that he gave for fiqh was معرفة الأحكام الشرعية العملية بأدلتها التفصيلية What was the first thing that he said? معرفة الأحكام الشرعية And if you remember correctly He said that the معرفة والمراد بقولنا معرفة is العلم والظن So the first point of definition of al-fiqh was ma'rifah, is to know. And he said two things fall under ma'rifah, right? Al-ilmu, knowledge, and al high speculation, and we spoke about that. We spoke about that in our first, first lesson. So because the first point of the definition of fiqh, ilm falls under it, the author, rahimahullah, saw it necessary to speak about knowledge. And also to speak about also al-dhan, which is high speculation. So that's why he's now going to go into al-ilm, knowledge. The author, rahimahullah, he says, al-ilm ta'rifu, al-ilm idraku shay' ala ma huwa alayhi idrakan jazima, ka idraki anna al-kulla akbaru min al-juz'i, wa anna al-niya tashartun fi al-ibadah. Fakharaja bi qawlina, idraku shay' adam al-idraki bil-kulliya, wa yusamma al-jahlu, wa yusamma al-jahlu al-basit. مثل أن يسأل متى كانت غزوة بدر فيقول لا أدري وخرج بقولنا على ما هو عليه إدراك على وجه يخالف ما هو عليه ويسمى الجهل المركب مثل أن يسأل متى كانت غزوة بدر فيقول في السنة الثالثة من الهجرة وخرج بقولنا إدراكا جازما إدراك الشيء إدراكا غير جازم بحيث يحتمل عنده أن يكون على غير الوجه الذي أدركه فلا يسمى ذلك علما ثم إن تر ثم ثم إن ترجح عنده ثم إن ترجح عنده أحد الاحتمالين فالراجح ظن والمرجوح وهم وإن تساوى الأمران فهو شك وبهذا تبين أن تعلق الإدراك بالأشياء كالآتي الأول علم وهو إدراك الشيء على ما هو عليه إدراكا جازما الثاني جهل بسيط وهو عدم الإدراك بالكلية الثالث جهل مركب وهو إدراك الشيء على وجه يخالف ما هو عليه الرابع ظن وهو إدراك الشيء مع احتمال ضد المرجوح مع احتمال ضد المرجوح وهم وهو إدراك الشيء مع احتمال ضد راجح شك وهو إدراك الشيء محتمال ضد مساو. Knowledge. The definition of knowledge is the perception of something for what it really is and being firmly aware of it, such as knowing that the whole is greater than the part, and that the intention is a requirement for worship to be accepted. So what is excluded from our words, the perception of something, is the lack of the complete awareness of something which is called jahal basir. Plain ignorance, such as someone, such as someone being asked, "When was the Battle of Badr?" and he replies, "I do not know." And what is also excluded from our words, what is really, what it really is, is to perceive something different from what it really is. This is called jahl murakkab, compounded ignorance, such as someone being asked, "When was the Battle of Badr?" to which he replies, "In the third year after migration." when actually it was during the second year after the migration. And what is also excluded from our words, firmly aware of it, is the perception of something is a non-assertive, in a non-assertive, 
is the perception of something in a non-assertive way. So it is likely to be different from the way it was perceived. Then that is not called knowledge. Then if he prefers one over the other possibility, then it is referred to as dhan and the other possibility as wahm. And if both are thought to be the same, then it is called shak, doubt. And this shows that the perceptions of things are attached to the following. Number one, knowledge, the perception of something for what it really is and being firmly aware of it. Number two, plain ignorance, a lack of awareness in the totality of something. Number three, compounded ignorance, a perception of something in contravention to what it really is. Number four, dhan, a perception of something with the prospect of it being against a less correct view. Number five, wahm, a perception of something with the possibility of it being against the most correct view. Number six, shak, a perception of something with the possibility of it having something equally correct opposing it. Now, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to speak about what the scholars refer to and they call it maratibul idraq, the levels of perception. The levels of perception. The highest of them is knowledge and the second one is ignorance and ignorance is two types. And then we're going to go into dhan and we'll see what dhan is, speculation, waham, which is suspicion um, and shak, which is doubt. And what each one, the difference between it, we'll see inshallah ta'ala. My translation may not be accurate, but my explanation will be inshallah ta'ala. The author, rahimahullah, he started with al-ilm, knowledge. What does knowledge mean? It means idraq shay it's to perceive something. The word idraq, it means in the Arabic language, at-tasawwur, perception. So pay attention here, a person is perceiving something, perception in his head. Something is in his head, he perceives it, he sees it in that way. Now, what's in your mind when it comes to the perception and what it is externally have to be, be the same. Knowledge is what? What's in your mind and what you think and what you've perceived and what it's out there have to be together, they have to be the same. And there's a third thing that's needed as well, which is you have to have certainty. That is what it's called knowledge. So it's three things knowledge stands on. What is it? There is a perception, number one. As it is. As it, as it is. And last but not least, the person is certain about it. So for example, somebody asks you and they said to you, what is this? They asked you, what is this? Straight away there is a perception in your head, something you've perceived something. You looked and you perceived something. Second is, you speak out and you say, oh, this is a cup, a plastic cup. Is your perception and what, you, what it is, are they the same? Yes. And then you're certain. You are what? You are certain about it. So when we say perception, let's start. How many points did we say that knowledge stands on? Three. The first one is perception. What did we push out of the definition? What did we dismiss to get out of the definition? What we're going to see is ignorance. Or one type of ignorance, which is called jahlun basit. We're going to see it, inshallah ta'ala. Jahlun basit, the simple type of ignorance, the person doesn't have a perception. You'll say to this person, what is this? he say to you, I don't know. In his head, there's no perception. That's called what? Jahlun Basir. We got rid of Jahlun Basir. Okay? And the Sheikh gave another example, which is um, asking the person, Mata kanad ghazwa to Badr? When was the Battle of Badr? And he said, La adri, I don't know. So there's no perception in his head at all. We got rid of that in the first point. Alama huwa as it is, what did we get rid of? What did we push out of, out of the definition? And what did we get rid of? We got rid of the second type of ignorance, which is jahl uh, murakab, a compounded ignorance. Because the second type of ignorance, which is known as the compounded ignorance, is what? The person has perception. But the problem is, the reality and the perception are 
they are going against each other. So what is perceived and what it really is out, out there or what externally is, is not, the, is not in correlation. They're not, they're not together. So you ask the person and you say to them, what is this? And he says to you, this is a mobile phone. So is there a perception in that person's mind? Yeah, there is. The person has perceived something. They perceived a the mobile phone. But is this a mobile phone I'm holding up? It's not a mobile phone. It is a what? It's a plastic cup. And the Shaykh gave the example of the same question. When was the Battle of Badr? And instead of saying the second year of the Hijriya, after the Hijriya, he said third year. So he has a perception, but his perception is incorrect. We got rid of that in the second point of the of the way the ilm, we got rid of it. Um, and just as a side point, why is it called compounded ignorance? We said the ignorance is how many types? It's two types. An easy ignorance and a compounded ignorance. The reason why it's called a compounded ignorance is because, number one, the person does not know. Adam al-ilm, there's no knowledge there. And the second thing is in there is i'tiqad al-ilm, the person believes they know. So it's compounded of those two things. That's why it's called compounded ignorance. He actually thinks he knows. And that type of ignorance is hard to remove. When you don't know and you think you know. Are you with me? It's when you don't know and you think you... When you think you know. And that type of person is... In a sad situation, the poet he said, "Wa fil jahli qabla al mauti mautu li ahlihi." He said that ignorance is a death. Ignorance, he said, "Wa fil jahli." Inside ignorance, there is qabla al mauti mautu li ahlihi. It's a death for the individual before the real death comes to them. If you're ignorant, you're dead. Way before <coughs> the actual ignor the actual death comes to you. So pay attention. He said, وَفِي jahli In ignorance, there's a death. The person who's ignorant is dead, he's dying, he's on his deathbed, or he's even a dead person. He's a dead walking person. Before the actual death comes to him. And look what he said, فَأَجْسَامُهُمْ قَبْلَ الْقُبُورِ قُبُورُ And their bodies are the graveyard before they actually go into the actual graveyard. You see? And then he said, وَإِنْ imra'an." If an individual لم يحيى بالعلم ميت, if a person is not revived with knowledge, then he dies. He's going to be dead. فليس لو حتى النشور نشور. And then guess what? Anything that tries to awaken him and anyone who tries to bring him out won't be able to, because ignorance is the biggest enemy. ولذلك the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he referred to ignorance as what? The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he referred to it as a disease that needs to be cured you know the famous hadith of the man who asked uh, his companions his friends his colleagues he asked them and he said to them after he had a wound on his head and he said to them i can't use water i am scared that it will go into my head and i might die from it and etc can you guys find me a ruling out of it and they said to him we can't as long as the water is there you have to use it because they only knew that the only time that you can do tayammum is when there's no water there. So he said, okay. So he used the water and he died. He took their fatwa. So then they went to the Prophet and they told the Prophet. They said, Ya Rasulullah, the, the man, he's asked us this question and we gave him this ruling. The Prophet وسلم, he said, Allah. They killed him, may Allah kill them. Then the Prophet وسلم, he said, why did they not ask if they didn't know? Then the Prophet said, فَإِنَّمَا شِفَاءُ السُّؤَالِ The cure to ignorance was asking. The cure to ignorance is what? Asking. Ridarika poet he said, وَلَيْسَ الْعَمَى طُولَسْ وَلَيْسَ الْعَمَى Blindness and a person being blind is not طُولَ السُّؤَالِ That you ask questions too much. You're not blind if you're questioning and you're interrogating and you're investigating and you're asking. He said, that's not blindness. Like he said, إِنَّمَا تَمَامُ الْعَمَى طُولَ السُّكُوتِ عَلَى الْجَهْلِ It's to be silent on ignorance for the rest of your life. You're too shy to ask. You don't want to ask, you don't want to verify, you don't want to know. So, وَلَيْسَ الْعَمَى طُولَ السُّؤَالِ وَإِنَّمَا تَمَامُ الْعَمَى طُولَ السُّكُوتِ طُولَ السُّكُوتِ عَلَى الْجَهْلِ A person, if he doesn't know, he should say, I don't know. But there is a point I want to mention here, 
as a side benefit, and I think it will benefit the people to know, which is the difference between knowledge and intellects. Okay, there is a difference between ilm and aql. Sah? Knowledge is something and intellect is another thing. And there's nothing better than a line of poetry. A poet, he said, Ilmul alimi wa aqlul aqil ikhtalafa. Knowledge and intellect had a aql and ilm had a discussion. They talked to each other. They had a dispute, argument. They said to each other, من ذا الذي فيهما قد أحرز الشرف Which of us has reached the pinnacle of nobility? Who from amongst us, me or you, is the best? Knowledge. Do you think you're better than me? Aql is knowledge to aql. Do you think you're better than me? Which of you, me and you, is better? فالعلم قال, knowledge said, أنا أحرزت غايته. Knowledge said, I reached the pinnacle. I reached the highest level. I'm at the highest level. Well, Aqlu Qala, then the Aqal, he said, and Ar Rahman will be Urifa. Aqal said, Through me, Allah is known. In the Quran, what does Allah wa ta'ala say in some places? You know, the ayah, what did Allah say? Am Khuliqun min Ghayri Shayin, Am Humul Khaliqun, Am Khalaqu Samawati, Wal Arab, Bella Yukinun. These verses are making you think, Aqal. Who created this? Who brought this in? Aql is saying, I'm better than you, knowledge. You know why I'm better than you? Because it's through me Allah was known. فَأَفْصَحَ الْعِلْمُ إِفْصَاحًا وَقَالَ لَهُ Knowledge thought for a bit and then it brought out eloquency from its mouth and it spoke word of gold. And it said, بِأَيِّنَ اللَّهُ Which of us, me or you, فِي قُرْآنِ التَّصَفَ Which of you, me or you, does Allah refer to himself as? Does Allah call himself Aqil or does he call himself Ali? فَأَيْقَنَ الْعَقْلُ Then Aqal realized أَنَّ الْعِلْمَ سَيِّدُهُ That knowledge is his master. فَقَبَّلَ الْعَقْلُ رَأْسَ الْعِلْمِ وَانْصَرَفَ And he kissed him on the forehead and they went out together. So this teaches us what? What does this teach us? That it's really knowledge that is greater than al-aql. Here I want to point out something very important and I really want to use this opportunity to debunk and dismantle a group of people who misguided from the straight path. The point that I want to mention inshallah ta'ala is the relationship. This is a big topic itself. A topic it deserves series, not one or two or three series to be discussed which is the concept of the aql and the textual evidence. There are some people who've exceeded their limits when it comes to this issue. Meaning they've come with exaggeration in it. And there's a group of people who are negligent when it comes to the place that the aql has. So it's fair, inshallah ta'ala, to bring everything into its perspective. What we have to understand is the aql what is this relationship with the text? Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said something very powerful and I think this itself should be written in ink of gold. Salahatan. Now if I, be, I believe a Muslim lives by this, this, just this statement alone, they will benefit, wallahi. Falah fi dunya wa la In this world and hereafter. Which is, he said, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he said, al-shar'u walla al-aqla. The sharia and the, uh, the religion, it gave governorship and it made intellect a governor. Okay? And then it chose to take its position away from it. What does Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah mean? Are you with me? When you came into Islam, are you with me? You came to Islam not because you knew the Quran or the Sunnah. You came into it from the, the ways that brought you to Islam it was your aql. You used your brain. So what happened is the aql brought you into Islam 
And then after you came into Islam, the Sharia said to you, no longer do we need it. The text is enough for you. وَلِذَلِكَ سَعِيدِ بْنُ جُبَيْنِ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ He said, مَا لَا يَعْرِفُهُ الْبَدْرِيُّونَ That which the people of Badr did not know, فَلَيْسَ مِنَ الدِّينِ It's not from the religion. And what the Sahabas and the noble people didn't know, then that's not from the religion. There's another statement that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, which I liked. He said, الشَّرْعُ قَاضٍ The Shara, the Quran and the Sunnah, are the judge. وَالْعَقْلُ شَاهِدْ and the aqal is what? It's the witness. In a courtroom, there's a judge and there's witnesses, right? The, the judge here is the shara. And the shahid, the witness is who? The aqal. وَيَجُوزُ لِلْقَاضِ It is permissible for the judge tardu shahidi to dismiss the witness متى شاء whatever he wants. He can say to him, we don't need your testimony. Does that make sense? So the Sharia, when it wants to, it can dismiss the p- opinions of people's logic. Because it has a higher position. It's the qadi, it's what judges. Are you with me? And if somebody doesn't really become aware of that, he will fall into tamat. And your intellect is only permitted to what? To look into, to research to object, to agree, all in accordance to what the Sharia permits it. The aql is res- only can look into and observe and research and agree or disagree if the Sharia lets it. If it doesn't, it can't do that. Abdullah ibn Abbas, rahimahullah, he said something. He said that the same way, pay attention here, the same way that your eyesight are limited in how far you can see, your aql is also limited in how far it can think. And that's the problem with many people. They've given the aql an unrestricted rights. That the aql can do what it wants and how it wants, to the extent that they believe it can govern the book of Allah Azza wa and the sunnah. Are you with me? So that's very important. Coming back to what the author said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, what was the first, third thing that he said? Idraken jaziman. We're talking about knowledge, we said the three points, right? The first one is perceiving something. The second one was as it is. And the third one was what? With certainty. There's no doubt in your heart. When we said th- certainty, three things are what drops. Three things are what we push out of the definition. Let me just repeat because I did go on a, a tangent, I did go off topic. When we said perception, what was it that got out of the definition and we pushed out of the definition and we made sure it was, was not in the definition? Is the jahl basir, the simple ignorance, there's no perception, صح? When we said as it is, what did we push out of the definition? The compounded ignorance. Okay, and the reason we explained why it's called compounded ignorance, صح? Because we said number one, there's no knowledge there and the second problem is the person thinks they, they believe that they know. They think they know, but they don't know. So that's why it's compounded. It's two things on top of each other. That's why it's called Jahlul Murakab. The third thing in the definition of knowledge I said is what? Learning it with certainty. Here, what drops is three things. We get rid of how many things? Three things. The first one is Dhan. Speculation is not in there. Because spe- speculation, Dhan. It's better to learn the Arabic word because in English the translation is not definitely, is not definite and it's not accurate. Okay? It's better to learn it in Arabic and then learn what the, defin- the word means and, and, ex- and it, it should be explained to you. So, what are the three things that we pushed out of the definition? It is uh, dhan. What does dhan mean? Dhan means You've perceived something as it is, but there is in your heart a doubt that it's not. So the person's asked, what is this? Okay. He goes, this is a plastic cup. 
and we're all together. It's a plastic cup. So he has perception, and his percep- and his answer is in accordance to what? The reality. It's in accordance to the that which is in front of him. But in his heart, he hasn't got that certainty that comes with the knowledge, right? But here the certainty, the percentage is very high. How many percent is it? It's 70. That's called what? Dhan. What is that called? That 70% that he's got in his heart is called what? It is called Dhan. What about the remaining 30%? The remaining 30% is called Wahm. If he, let's turn the table, if he said this is a cup, a plastic cup, there's a perception, it is, in re- it, is, it is in accordance to the reality in front of him, but the percentage of what he thinks of it is how much? 30%, it's not 70%. This is called Wahm now. Are we all together? Does that make sense? It's very low. What about if it's the same, 50-50? This is called Shak. Does that make sense? Those are the six that the author mentioned. You learnt all of them in a very simple way. All of those are called what? All of those six are called, they are called Maratibul Idraki. It's called the level of perception. Sahih? And this is very good for you to learn it. It's very good for you to learn it because Atheists, they try to make you what? They try to push you on these concepts and these terms. It's very important that you learn it. Because these are knowledge that are taught in Ilmul Mantiq. Ilmul Mantiq, you learn two things. That's what it really stands on. Tasdiq and Tasawwur. That's really what you learn in Ilmul Mantiq. And that's another topic for itself. But there's a seventh one that some scholars add to it. There's a seventh one that some scholars add to it, which is called al i'tiqad. What is it called? al al i'tiqad. al i'tiqad means a level between ilm and dhan. It's a level between what? It's higher than it's higher than uh, dhan and it's lower than ilm. They say i'tiqad is what? Yaqbalu tashkik. It can accept speculation to be opened on it. Okay? Because knowledge doesn't accept speculation to be opened on it. Somebody told you, no, this is a mobile phone. However, 50,000 times that he says it, it won't change, right? Like in belief, Yaqbalu tashkik. It can accept shak. Can accept shak. Why do you see a Christian becoming a Muslim? He believed in something and now he moved away from it because speculation came into it. Doubt. That's i'tiqad belief. Now the author, rahimahullah, he goes into the, uh, the types of knowledge. We've learned the types of ignorance and now he's going to talk about the types of Knowledge. He says, أقسام العلم ينقسم العلم إلى قسمين ضروري ونظري فالضروري ما يكون إدراك المعلوم فيه ضروريا بحيث يضطر إليه من غير نظر ولا استدلال كالعلم بأن الكل أكبر من الجزء وأن النار حارة وأن محمدا رسول الله والنظري ما يحتاج إلى نظر واستدلال كالعلم بوجوب النية في الصلاة Categories of knowledge. Knowledge is divided into two parts, the essential and the theoretical. Number one, essential knowledge is that the thing known is essential whereby a person can't help but know it without the need to look for it or try to extrapolate it, such as the knowledge that the whole is greater than the part and that the fire is hot and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Number two, theoretical knowledge is what needs to be considered and looked into, such as knowledge that the intention is necessary in the prayer. Here the author, he speaks about knowledge, but from what angle? 
Because the categorization of knowledge is from many different ways. You can categorize knowledge from many different perspectives. And you should, get, you, should not, you should understand that things can be categorized from many different perspectives. For example, I can categorize a person from his height. You can say he's either tall or short. Or I can say um, the person's weight. You know, the athletic, the average, the chubby, whatever. Or the person's back color skin, skin color. وَمَا إِلَى ذَلِكَ So one person, you can categorize them in many different ways. The same is when it comes to knowledge. And this is one of its types of categorization, which is how did the information come about? بِاعْتِبَارِ طَرِيقِ إِدْرَاكِ الْمَعْلُومِ How did you perceive this information? Okay. So it's categorized into how many? Two. The first one is عِلْمٌ ضَرُورِيٌ What does عِلْمٌ ضَرُورِيٌ mean? It, it means essential knowledge or necessary knowledge. It is knowledge that doesn't require any observation and it doesn't require for one to look for it or, or even ask evidence for it. It's what philosophers and others might say, self-evident. It doesn't require evidence. It's called necessary knowledge. You don't ask evidence for it. And from them is that the fire is hot. That the fire is hot. For example, that the house is bigger than the door. That's called what? Ilmun daruriyun. And from that enters Allah's existence, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah's existence is daruriyun. It doesn't require any evidence. Trying to prove Allah's existence and trying to bring evidence for Allah's existence is a logical absurdity. It's a what? It's a logical absurdity to try to say that I'm going to prove God's existence. Allah Taala is self-evident. You talking this minute and saying what you're saying is an evidence of Allah's existence. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah says to us in the Quran, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ Allah says we're going to show our signs in the sky and in the universe. And we're also going to show them our signs in them. You are a, you are a proof of Allah's existence, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in another ayah, وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَفَلَا تُبْصِرُونَ why don't you look at yourself and ponder over yourself? So nowadays when you see Muslims saying that we're going to prove God's existence, it kind of gives validity to the opposite, your, the person you're debating and your, interloc loc inter your interlocutor. You're accepting from him that his argument has premise. And some things they are not accepted, even if there's a person who's opposing you, Sahih. For example, if somebody wanted to debate for the rape, for instance, you can't say, well, prove his, his theory is wrong. Aslan, he shouldn't be even given a platform, or nor should he be given any consideration in his argument. صح? The same is when it comes to Allah Ta'ala's existence. It doesn't require, evidence should not be looked for. Rather, the person who says Allah doesn't exist, the burden of proof is on him. He needs to provide that. He, why doesn't God exist? Until now, atheists haven't proven why God doesn't exist. Make sense? So that's ilmun daruriyun. It's not. It's something that is known out of necessity. The second type is called ilmun nadari. It's called ilmun nadari, and that is empirical evidence. Empirical knowledge. Empirical knowledge is that which is known from looking, observing, researching, traveling, asking, demanding, requesting. It comes through those methods. For example, is an intention required for the salah or is it not? 
for example, that the zakat is not done from fruits. This is empirical evidence. It does require research. It does require looking into it. It's not something everybody would know. This one, the scholars, they say it comes from I'malu dhihni. You have to stimulate your mind and think. Okay? And this one comes about with a correct premise. Then with the correct premise produces and it brings about a correct result. The premise is right. And from there comes a um, upright, um, justifiable result. But there are things that can be debated whether they are ilmun daruriyun or ilmun nadari, whether they are knowledge that is known out of certainty or whether this is knowledge that is known by observation, by looking. It can sometimes change. Somebody can say to someone, uh, I see this to be ilmun daruriyun and another one could say no, it's ilmun nadari. It can happen and sometimes it is subjective. Sahih. But some things are not subjective. And we mentioned some of them. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah has a kitab called Al Raddu al Al Mantiqiyin. Shaykh al Islam, the first volume, page 40, he goes in great details with this issue. The issue of knowledge, uh, that which is known out of necessity, and that which needs observation and looking. What's very sad is. Those atheists today who reject Allah's existence when it's knowledge that is known out of necessity. It's in daruri on Allah's existence, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sah? The poet, he said, It's not befitting for the mind if a person asks you to prove the sun when the sun is out. You see, it's not befitting. It just shows how dim it is. If you start arguing with that person, then... I have the right as a third person to say both of you are crazy. <laughs> For even trying to argue with him makes you crazy. It's sad that atheists today, they dismiss that the fact that Allah Ta'ala's existence is daruriyun and they accept as evidence something that they themselves admit, which is ilmun nadari, which is science. Science is based upon what? Science is based upon empirical evidence. It's based upon deduction. They don't reach a conclusion in something unless they what? They have to do isti'ab al tam. And that's a discussion for another day. I'm going to conclude there inshallah ta'ala. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and shaitan and Allah and his messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi.